What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, um, AC, we were just talking before we hit record here with, we like hearing the challenge stories. And so like I had Moise Navone on of Mobileye. Mobileye helps, it basically helps fuel autonomous vehicles. Um, they were acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion. But the real journey, as you know, was a lot of downs, not just ups. And he had to go back to his family at one point and he had to take a pay cut and say, listen, uh, we kids, I'm pulling you out of all extracurriculars. Um, we can no longer eat out. Uh, I just got, you know, I have to take a pay cut because we need to keep this sustainable, you know, and that's the reality of anyone who's been through this journey that happens. Okay. So um, check that out, episode out and many more. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Uh, and we help B2B businesses connect their dream clients and give to them, give to them their best relationships by running their podcast. We will launch and run your podcast so it actually serves your best relationships and you can profile your, your, your the companies you believe in and the people in the other you know CEOs that you want to profile and their thought leadership. So check out rise25.com. You know, there's a, if you go to the about page on inspiredinsider.com, you can see um, the actually motivation behind this is more than just business AC. It's like my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor and his legacy lives on and his story lives on because there was an interview done by the Holocaust Foundation with him. So you can check that out on my about page, but check out rise25.com. If you have questions about podcasting, we've been doing it for over 10 years. So um, I am excited to introduce today's guest and um, like literally I, I uh, do this all the time, I see. I was trying to order a water system for my new office. And I said, I do not answer calls from numbers I don't recognize. So can you please text me before you call me? So I was actually wanting the text because that just made for a better experience for me because I know I'm not gonna answer the phone, you know, if, they, if I don't recognize the number. So AC Evans I have here who's a pioneer in conversational marketing and the co-founder and CEO of drips.com. Drips is a conversational texting company leading the way for some of the biggest brands in the world. Um, they use automated, humanized, and they'll talk about humanized conversations at scale of companies like Liberty Mutual, CreditRepair.com, many more. On a daily basis, Drips engages in millions of completely humanized conversations with zero client-side human resources or operators. Um, AC, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. You know, there's so many places to start, and I do want to talk about you know, from the startup phase to the scale up phase, the culture and scaling and hiring. But I kind of want to start with the roots, the roots of your story, because I was talking to another entrepreneur the other day and they're worried about their kids and maybe one of their child isn't amazing at school. And they're like, I'm, you know, I'm not sure how we navigate these waters and talk about your journey a little bit from, from college. Yeah. Uh, e even in high school, uh, I was a poor student, you know, I was a, D minus uh, student uh, failed, uh, almost failed a couple of times, had to go to summer school to make up. Uh, I just, I, I wasn't attracted to the the curriculum or, or the way it was presented. And I luckily at the time I was in uh, a wrestling school, uh, meaning a, a school that had a, you know, a decent wrestling team. And I was on that team and the wrestling coach suggested that I looked into a vocational school. So this was a school where it was more hands-on, you would go there your uh, junior and senior year mm. and uh, do hands on training. There was mechanics, uh, cooks, uh, you know, a lot of cosmetology, a lot of different uh, trade skills. And the one course that I joined was digital design, which was I was a mm. great artist. Uh, I, I used to draw a lot. That's where I spent most of my time during class doing was drawing, which, you know, doesn't necessarily uh align with the curriculum and, 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 and math and English and whatnot. Um, but I, uh, I, I joined the vocational school. I dug into digital design and, and I quickly became one of the, uh, you know, top students there. I, I had perfect. What attendance. was it? 
at, yeah. the, at the traditional, was it a motivation thing? Was it like a learning thing? What, what yeah. do you think it was? I think it was an interest thing, you know, mm-hmm. like, and I have the same problem today. If I'm not interested in something, I, I give it very little thought. It's, um, I have to try to find things that I'm interested in learning about, interested, mm-hmm. interesting, interested in doing or, or, or knowing more about, uh, you know, if I pick up a book and I go through 20 pages and it's not like speaking to me, I, I, I rarely, uh, you know, nowadays I'll just put the book down, but, but before it was very difficult for me to push myself through that mm. material. Uh, and the same was true in school. So I think it was just, you know, maybe it was stylistic of, of the way they taught, like that was definitely more hands-on meaning I was doing design. I was doing coding. We weren't just talking about it or, you know, doing, you know, instead of doing history and science, I was able to do, uh, automation and, and digital design and graphics and things that were just more interesting to me candidly. Um, but out of that, I got early placement at, uh, the Brown stadium. I was the youngest, the youngest person working in the production area of the Brown. So I was Mm. the one that was designing all the 3d animation and the, the helmets clashing. And I did the same job at the Cavs stadium, uh, so where do they show that? Is that like where they like break for break for commercial and I see, you see those helmets kind of going boom? Yeah, it was oh, actually awesome. on on the scoreboards, uh, mm. which was cool because at the time the Brown Stadium was brand new. This was in 99, I think, in 2000. Mm-hmm. And the stadium was brand new, state-of-the-art equipment. I had, I had been sent uh, to D.C. to do in, in Rochester to do training on Dactronics uh, scoreboards, which were, huh. again, like top of the line, new, new, new stuff. But yeah, it was the it was the boom, boom, clap, boom, boom, clap. You know, all that kind of animation. We need stuff. to find that. How do we find that to put on the beginning of this intro? Oh man, of the podcast. That would be amazing. It would probably be embarrassing the way it looks nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what they got now? But uh, you know, long story short, I got I got let go of that job. Uh, I, I was great at the stuff that I was interested in. Again, just a show my my pattern and progression through you know through what eventually landed me in entrepreneurialism but i was great at the design great at the creative work uh but one of my jobs on game day was to be there uh in case something went wrong right in case i had Mm -hmm. to queue something up but most of my job was in uh, pre-production uh but the one thing that the director had me do and it was probably because i was just the youngest person i had nothing else to do during the game except watch the game was i had to record the game so i had to take this this giant beta vhs looking uh you know uh <laughs> recording device and I, I would have to put it in hit record and then at halftime pop it out put the next one in hit record file it and give it back to them and that was the only thing i had to do on game day and i went a handful of games i, I can't remember how many six or seven games that season uh doing it no problem no problem but then one one game i got caught up doing a design i wasn't even watching the, the game I'm, I'm not a big sports fan but i was caught up doing this cool design with this, this helmet spinning around and i forgot to record the second half of the game uh and i go up to the, the director his name was dan i said hey dan uh i forgot to record the second half man and he looked at me and said what do you what do you mean you forgot and i said well i you know i was busy working on the design it's really cool i can show you he's like hold on hold on you can't forget to record the game. Keep in mind, this is this is 2000, right? This is before DVR and TiVo and and all this stuff. Right. So so there's literally a hole in the NFL archives somewhere uh, because of you know young. <laughs> what would they old. use for that? What do they use it for? It was for the archives. It was literally oh, for the for, archives. It was yeah. literally for the record. The like AC uh, ruined history of football. Yeah, next door. Th- there's a hole in the Browns uh, archives that 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 has my name on it. Uh, <laughs> And, and, and oh, the, the, the director, you know, he said, he said, look, like you're a good kid. You do great work, but you can't forget to record the game, the end, you know? And he said, if it happens again, you're fired or otherwise I'm going to get fired. Uh, no problem, sir. Won't happen again. Three weeks later, it happened again, fired mm. me on the spot. Uh, and I've had a string of jobs that went something mm. like that, where if I'm interested in it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm digging in, I'm, I'm pushing for it. But it, the second it loses my interest, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I just don't give it a, as much focus as it, it as it should. And get. you but said, you know, you dropped out of college. Again, same. Um, yeah, I was I was interested and, and enjoyed the marketing class, the psychology class. But my parents made enough money at the time that I couldn't get government aid, and I didn't make enough money to to pay for uh, my own college. So I had to work during the day, uh, and then I was doing night school 
which which sucked you know as an 18 year old uh you're, you're there with uh, you know people way way older than you yeah. um the the courses aren't as interesting the 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 teachers uh aren't as you know you're not in a big auditorium. socially it's not like people your own age that you can socialize with yeah so it was very it was very hard and i and i candidly i went to college just because i thought that was what you were supposed to do you know like mm -hmm. i just so i went to akron U. I'm a, I'm a big fan of akron and it was close and there, you know candidly they were one of the only places that would take me um and and long story short a couple semesters in i, I had to drop out but I was making six figures uh, online doing my own thing at the time. So I felt I felt good about the, about the dropout, uh, paid off the little bit of money I owed them and, and really just never looked back. I, I never again worked for uh, another company. I never again uh, prescribed to any uh, higher education. Uh, I, I, I even up to that point, I, I barely ever read a book cover to cover that wasn't required reading. Mm. Uh, now I've read, you know, hundreds of books and I, and I dig in and self-educate myself on mm -hmm. a lot of different things. Um, but again, it's the, it's the curriculum of my choosing, yeah. which, which I think was always the, the piece that I was missing in, in high school and college. Real quick, AC, what are some of your favorite books? What are some business or leadership books we should be checking out? My, I think I have like three credits in my audible account that need to be used. So uh, the, uh, you might, I don't know if you've read, uh, man's search for meaning, but this one is of my a, favorite books, Victor yeah, Frankel, okay, yeah, totally. I assume yeah. with your grandfather's experience, that would be an interesting one. I, I just come came up with a short list for books I'd recommend during this pandemic. That was yeah. one, uh, -huh. uh, just because I think everybody should learn to appreciate that your mindset is something that you control, uh, yeah. no matter what your surroundings are. And if he could make it through that with somewhat of a positive attitude, how could we not make it out of this? Right. Exactly. Uh, the obstacle is the way is a book I enjoy. Uh, it's a Ryan, yeah, Holiday, Ryan book. Holiday. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so another one that I think is appropriate for this pandemic, I personally have found immense growth, uh, in, in my, in my, uh, my impact, my relationships, my family throughout this pandemic. Uh, the one thing I think is a good book. Mm. Uh, this yeah. is all about, I've had the author on, uh, the co-author Jay Papasin yep. on. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, you know, I, I also enjoy books like uh, Tim Ferriss's, you know, Tools for Titans and Tribe of Mentors. Like to me, those are great because you can pick them up, flip through two pages, get some good content. Uh, that I thought was probably the best author book hack I've ever seen. He literally just took his podcast and yeah, tra exactly. transcribed it and made a best selling book. You know, I was like, wow, that's that's super smart. Um but yeah, those are probably the, the the three that are most top of mind for me right yeah. now. If if people are looking for a, I, I have a book club in my company now that oh, I run. Nice. Um, and uh, what's right now? What's the, uh, the the one thing is right oh, now? Oh, the one thing is okay. Yep, yep. So we're gonna do a review. I'll of give that. a shout out. I'll tag um, a shout out to Jeff and Jay. Um, you know, at the one thing, and Jeff runs the one thing podcast. So yeah. Jeff, if you want to have AC on the podcast, uh, you know, I'll tag you in this. Yeah, that'd so. be great. I'd love to pick his brain on a couple of different points in the book. Um, and then another book that I, I love for, for entry level readers or people that just want to read more that don't read uh, because it, maybe it's uh, it seems like it's a daunting task to crush through a book is uh, How to Fight a Hydra. I can't remember the hmm. author's name, but it's it's a very small parable or, Never heard or, of that. or metaphor on uh, uh, problem solving. Um, and it's a story, you know, it's a fictional story about a guy that decides to go on this quest to find and fight a Hydra and, you know, the What's Hydra. A Hydra? A Hydra is the, the, the dragon with the, the multiple heads. And, oh, got it. Got yeah, it. And when you chop the head off, two more heads grow out. <laughs> um, but it's, again, it's, it's a metaphor for problem solving and it's, yeah. it's, it's a super fun read. You can read it in, you know, 35 minutes or so. We were talking about also helping people win at work. Um, yeah. Gary Ridge. Great. What book. did you like about that one? Uh, I like just the structure it gave. I, I read that book when the company drips, I think was maybe 12 employees, something like that. And we were mm -hmm. getting to the point where we knew we had to give people more than a thumbs up or a thumbs down as far as quantitative feedback. Yeah. Um, and that book, I think it gives a very, very strong structure. Uh, we've, we've since adopted different toolings and technologies, uh, and, and methodologies. We, 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 uh, performance is 50% performance and 50% culture alignment, uh, which I think is important for a, a scaling company to, to really button up their culture and, 
if you have any books on that, that would be something I'd be interested in. I haven't read, I've, I've had a lot of good entrepreneurs uh, and founders help me learn a lot about culture and establishing core values and measuring and defending it. But I, I haven't read any, uh, I haven't found any great books on it yet. Yeah, there's um, actually, it's funny because, so I had a guest on um, and David Long, um, he does, they, basically that's what they specialize in. Um, which is kind of employee retention and culture. And he talked about, you know, they have programs for like Walmart of the world and like large companies. But um, he talked about his, his company's My Employees. Um, and he, he talks about Built to Lead. And, and he talks about one of the key elements he recommends is doing a book club mm. with, the, with the company, which you're doing. So um, shout out to David. But yeah, he's, he's done some amazing things and they help large companies, small com all across the, the gamut with their kind of principles of that. Um, the, you know, I want to talk about culture because culture is important to you. Um, and I do, we will talk about some specific use cases for, for drips.com uh, also. So if you are listening, you're like, you know, I have a couple of questions in here that I noted um, creative and copy is key. And that's one of the elements early on that I know AC focused in on, but just talk about culture for a second and going from a little bit from the startup to scale up and what do you do with culture to maintain the, you know, maintain that for the company? I think the biggest thing early on, I mean, and I mean really early, I had a, uh, a CEO coach, a local uh, gentleman by the name of Blake Squires, multiple time, you know, multiple exit entrepreneur, uh, real popular guy in Northeast Ohio. He's done a lot for the community. And I took him on as a CEO coach when, you know, we were going from call it four to 14 employees, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things he, he focused me in on was uh, mission statement, vision statement and core values. Mm -hmm. And the, the core values at the time, I remember it was, it was great because me and my co-founder, Anthony Greco, our, uh, our CTO, uh, he, he heads up technology for drips. Uh, we were defining the very DNA of what he and I, you know, represented, like what we thought our, uh, our, our, our key differentiators are, our, our, our true nature. And, and I literally mean ours as in Tony and mine. Uh, and those are lean, happy team, passion and improve. And we had a, you know, we had a whiteboard. Uh, the part of the practice was writing down everything we thought was critical, right? Uh, being analytic, uh, you know, drive, uh, you know, uh, yeah. you know, all the, all these different, uh, things you can imagine. And, and we whittled 48 things that we thought were, you know, kind of important to us down to these key five and these five drive everything. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is like, you can start with that. And the, again, the, the core values are, are very, very much a, uh, a DNA of the founders, uh, but eventually they have to be the DNA of the company. And the, the piece that I think that we learned not, not, not too long after, or maybe a year or so after was how I define happiness may be different than mm. the way you may define happiness. Right. So it became this, you know, this word that, uh, like somebody might define lean as something different than what I define as, or improve as something different than right. what I define as, or passion, you know, different, different people think different things. So, what we did uh, eventually, and this was a couple of years ago, I believe, uh, Katie, uh, who runs HR and culture now, she's just done a great job at really taking it on and, and giving it a real a real life. Uh, she's also on that leadership page. She uh, built out definitions of, of these different these different core values. And so we had three or four or five different kind of loose definitions. Uh, you know, lean to uh, save cycles and prove things via minimum viable products, you know, come with data, don't make gut decisions, make informed decisions, things like this. And uh, then uh, then we came up with examples. This is a level that it's funny, we hire a lot of a lot of people now. And when they ask about culture, I say, well, do you have two hours for me to, for me to, lecture, <laughs> for me to lecture you? Uh, and then when I show them this spreadsheet, I mean, with this huge multi page, uh, you know, document that it, that is true, tangible, actual examples of what does it look like when somebody is, is, uh, 
exemplifying these core values? And what does it look like when they transgress? Another one of my favorite books is the 48 Laws of Power. I don't know if mm. you've ever read that, but it's just interesting, you know, rules. Is that by Robert Green or yep, Robert? Yep, that's exactly right. Okay. It's a super, super cynical book. You have to, in my opinion, you have to read it with a grain of salt because it's a lot about like kings and queens and, you know, uh, how to survive the court and all these things. But um, it's still a lot of it's applicable today. And one of the things I thought they did great was they would have their rules, right? The 48 laws of power and examples and cool stories about those rules. But then they would have transgressions. And that's something that we added in that I, I've actually never seen another company do. So we actually have you know, 70 different examples of what does it look like wow. to simplify these different core values. And then another 50 or 60 uh, examples of what does it look like to transgress against those those values. So so what we do now is anytime, every time we do a big hiring wave, so like I just did this two weeks ago where I, I did a, a Zoom with I think seven or eight new hires and I talked through these and I showed the example and I said, hey guys, like, print this PDF out and circle all the ones that you are a transgressor of hmm. and, and be proud of that, you know, because one of our core values is improve. So you need to know what what it is that you can improve on. I, I specifically designed with Tony some of these examples and definitions to keep ourselves in check. You know, we, we put some transgressions like, man, I really know that I got to be better at this. I'm going to write that as a transgression so that I can keep myself uh, honest with it. So in my office at, at our HQ, which we're obviously not at right now, uh, I have these things printed up on my wall and you can see I got six or seven of them circled that I know I'm bad at and that I want to be better at. So, uh, yeah. what do you, what do you think you need improvement now? What are you working on now? Oh, there, there's so much, um, <laughs> the, one, one of the biggest for me and, and this, this, you know, candidly, this pandemic has been a great lesson for me is, is impact, you know, focus on the one thing, right? If I'm going to uh, give, give more shout out to the book, uh, but focusing on impact, focusing on leveling up my problem solving at the office, uh, the buzz of the office. And it's great. You know, we have a full-time chef, we have a production kitchen, we have these huge, massive lunches and breakfasts together as a team. Uh, and the buzz of the office is intoxicating. Uh, my office doesn't even have a door on it. It says like the janitor's closet. Uh, and I'm always running around. I'm always bouncing around. I'm always helping out and, and adding input and, and asking people what they're working on. And, and it's great, but I've, I've actually equated it to like, as far as impact goes, I was kind of like, a kind of like a lion eating field mice. You know, I was just mm. kind of jumping around solving very, very, very small problems, which a shouldn't be my focus and b i'm also taking the, the the ability away for somebody to solve that problem themselves uh or or to learn how to solve that problem so that that's been something that i i'm trying to challenge myself with is instead of giving answers uh asking more questions you know letting people come to the answers themselves instead of just just answering it it's it's been hard you know i mean it's only been a few years and Tony and I have, have built this thing up to almost 90 employees now. And in yeah. the beginning, it was like, look, if you got the answer, like we don't need to debate it. Just just run with it. You know, I mean, we were we were building and trying not to try not to run out of money and and or time. Uh, so there was no time for teaching. You know, there was no time for inception, if you will. Uh, but but now we're, we're absolutely at the point where Tony, myself and all the other executive leadership like we, we have to slow down, let other people, uh, make, make the mistakes candidly and, and, and learn. So because you put the people in place now, it frees your time up to do more things, which you want to be, you know, focus on more impactful things. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, again, because I was at the office and there's you know all these great people and teammates and people I, I, I really enjoy working with and, and helping, I just, I just know that I spent a significant amount, of, significant amount of my time just doing that, just helping very, mm. very, you know, random things, which is great. It, it's not that that's bad time spent, but what it meant was I wasn't spending my time working on bigger problems. Mm. I call it, I call it like hiding in the weeds, right? Because if I'm, if I'm hiding in the weeds and I'm solving these very, very uh, minute issues, I'm not leveling up my thinking or my focus as a leader to risk solving the big problems. Because when you risk solving a big problem and you miss a big project, you miss a big deal, you miss a big whatever it is, uh, that sucks, you know? But if I'm day to day solving these little problems doing whack-a-mole, it feels great, you get the dopamine response, 
I feel like I did 72 things during that day, but at the end of the day, did it really move the yeah. business forward or did yeah. I just help a bunch of small things out? Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite books is Wooden by John Wooden. And that, that quote resonates in my brain of does activity lead to, uh, or, you know, equate to achievement, you know? Yeah. Yeah. B busy is not impactful all the um, time. Talk about at what point do you decide to hire an HR person? Uh, well, Katie, we've had since, uh, I mean, she was, we had her, I can't remember what number of employees she was, uh, but she was very early on six, seven, maybe employee. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was very much office manager. She worked as my executive assistant, uh, and she just helped with kind of everything. I mean, poor Katie, she's had, she's had three jobs, you know, <laughs> for the past five years. Um, and, and very recently, uh, six months ago or so, uh, she dumped me, uh, and, and decided to start focusing on, uh, completely on HR and, and managing the office and the staff, uh, which, which is great. Um, so I had to find myself a new, uh, support person, uh, which is, which is always fun. You know, when, when you, when you build a, a bond like that, yeah. like Katie really, and I, I mean this truly, she took, uh, kind of Tony and my vision for the culture and, and, turned it into this organic living, breathing thing. And we have a very, what I would call, um, almost offensive, offensive. Yeah. HR, not defensive. You know, most HR is like there to make sure the company doesn't get sued and, you know, T's across and I's are dotted, but we have a very proactive, very, uh, deliberate, you know, uh, HR effort that is, that is focused around making sure that people are aligned with, and, and the company is aligned with the core values. And if you look at all the people that we let go or all the people that let go of themselves or, you know, self-selected out, all of them were, were not checking some of the core value boxes. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, they really weren't like they, you know, they actually, you know, didn't align just, just from their nature. And, and one of the things I, I tell people about core values and culture is that's not a bad thing like that. Like our core values are not right or wrong. They're just how Tony and I and the company now uh, are, it's our nature, right? It's like, it's like a, an animal isn't right or wrong for being how the animal is. It's just, it's just how they are. Uh, and, and there's many cultures out there. There's many companies yeah. that have the antithesis of, of our core values. I mean, like some people don't, some people are all about analytics and besides and, happy, hopefully happy isn't one of the antithesis ones. I, 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 <laughs> like I we hope, want you to be sad. Yeah. In the, oh, no, but I would hope so. But, you know, a lot of people don't don't talk about that. Like I always end with happiness when I'm talking through the core values. And and I tell people, I say, guys, like this is what it's all about. Like we spend more time with our coworkers, with our teammates, with our peers, with our prospects. You know, we literally spend more time during the week with these people than we do our own families and we do our wives, our husbands, our kids, our pets, uh, ourselves. You know, and if you're not happy in that you know, environment in that role, then you're just, you're setting yourself up for failure. To me, it's like having a bad, uh, a bad mattress. Like you have to spend a lot of time in your mattress, you know, uh, every night, you know, as, as, as a kid and as an adult. So like the sooner you can buy a nice mattress, uh, do it. A little, little shout out to all the mattress companies. Out yeah. There. yeah. I like Tempur-Pedic, but, um, the talk about some of the, the points in the company that you felt helped with the growth and you know, like I mentioned one, like I think is a, a huge um, sentiment to your ability to want outside help, which is having a CEO coach. What are some other things that you did throughout this journey that helped with your journey and moving it forward? I'll be honest. It, a lot of it's, you know, it started with my partners. So mm -hmm. uh, Tony Greco, my, my co-founder and our CTO, and then Tom Martindale, who, who's also on the, the leadership page. So Tom was actually our first client. So when we mm -hmm. built this tool, it was Tom's need. He was the only person we were doing this project for. It wasn't called drips. It wasn't called anything. Uh, but Tom had been around in business for some time and he brought on the first wave of clients uh, we quickly uh, partnered him into the company uh, and he runs our strategy. And what I mean by that is there's there's so many things that Tony and I, just as young, younger entrepreneurs, haven't ran into, haven't seen. I'm a bad negotiator, right? I'm a pleaser by nature. It's, it's just it's just in my DNA. Uh, so so Tom handles negotiations. 
uh, I'm bad at seeing um, risk, you know, technically or, or, or otherwise. I, I am a very ultra optimist. I see only abundance. That's my strength. Tony, on the other side, sees all the potholes and all the roads that we very well likely won't ever take. But he has this this keen ability to hit a button and his sonar just goes out in every direction and it sees every single piece of risk. Hmm. Uh, Tom, you know, is is more cynical than I am. I think, How did you meet Tony? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I like to tell the, the company and I do this at all hands once in a while that I met Tony and he was uh, he was 13 years old in an AOL chat room, uh, <laughs> which is the truth. You know, like we were we were in the old, uh, you know, programmer, hacker, chatter, AOL, spammer, you know, whatever you want to call it, like the kids that were tinkering, you know, like no, yeah. nobody really was into programming then. It yeah. wasn't even barely a thing. Well, I read uh, something, AC, that you coded something on MySpace that led to getting people tens of thousands of followers back in the day or something like that. Oh, yeah. So you have some technical abilities yourself, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, I, I coded the first version of Drips as well. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, I, I've always been the the MVP guy, back, back to our core value of lean. Um, we, we believe very, very uh, deeply in proof of concept, uh, minimum viable product. That's why we've been able to bootstrap to, to where we're at now is because we test uh, very quickly, fail very fast, and, and we don't build something, truly build it or truly architect it until value is absolutely proven. So mm. we actually ran drips. Again, it had no name. Uh, it was just a it was just a script that I built uh, for Tom in the back in the day. And we ran it for months before Tony built the next version. And then we ran that one for months before we hired some developers and, and rebuilt that version. Um, but yeah, the, the, the MySpace thing was fun. That was, have you ever seen the um, the little, it, you can actually pull it up if you got your computer there, uh, customsouthparks.com. Uh, so these are the little little doll maker websites where you can Custom change. Parks.com. Yeah, where you could change, you know, you can make a Dr. Jeremy White's uh, South Park character, right? And give it the glasses. <laughs> and a, I did not see that. No, I didn't. Yeah. But th these were these were hugely viral back in the day on MySpace. Everybody had their own little custom South Park, That's and and they you know they give it a blue shirt and put drips on the front of it, and you know give it the hair and the, and the earphones or whatever. And I built a way at the time to to go viral because back then there was no um, there was no way to share things. Uh, nothing could go viral because of the lack of the ability to share things. Facebook was very small then. The only way that you got the kind of traffic that we got is if you got showcased on like yahoo.com or something. Uh, but we built a way so that it would say, hey, Jeremy, uh, here's your custom South Park. Uh, if you'd like to share it with your friends, put in your MySpace email and password here. And they would. And, and you know, back then there was no security. There was no cap. There was no there was <laughs> in no, your bank account here. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we were you know, we had terms and conditions. We, we, we did it all super legitimately. But what it would do would it, it would take your username and password and it would it would log in to uh, your MySpace through PHP curl and it would go to all of your friends and post it on their wall. And it would post and it would say, uh, hey, Jane, uh, it's Jeremy. Check out my custom South Park. You should make one, too. And this thing just exploded. You know, I mean, it just went super, super, super viral. We were getting thousands and thousands of people uh, building and saving these little cartoons of themselves uh, daily. And uh, we made a lot of money uh, off that project uh, because we would we would uh, ask the people to run through and do surveys and self-select into different offers and whatnot. What did Tom see in that first version that was like, we? I need to be a part of this company. I need to do something with you guys. I uh, saw a 50% increase in performance uh, overnight. So we, so how it all started was Tom and I and Tony had a different business. And again, this is just another one of our projects or, or money hacks as I've, as I've come to call them these days as I look back. Uh, but long story short, he was using uh, a network that we had set up so that he could run more Facebook ads. He was in the student loan consolidation business. And one of uh, he, he had a CRM that every day it would take his, his database of users and send a text message to that group uh, around noon, I believe. And it would say, hello, call us back at 888 one five 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 one two one two to you know get your student loan consolidated and one day that system broke and he he called me up he said hey see i gotta i gotta get 
my texter broke. I need, I need you to fix it. I'm like, I can't fix somebody else's software. It's, <laughs> it's, it's their software. And he's like, well, they don't know what's wrong. And I gotta, I gotta get this thing going or otherwise I'm going to stop buying leads and I'm not going to be able to do this other work with you guys. And I was incentivized to get him back up and going very quickly because we had a different revenue of income coming in. Uh, so I asked him what it did. He explained it to me. I said, Oh, okay. Well, all right, go, go to twilio.com. Give me your, credentials. He didn't know what Twilio was. He's just putting in a credit card blindly. He's like, oh, okay, here's the credentials. And uh, about 12 hours later, I, it was about 3 a.m. I had scripted uh, exactly what his system did. It's something that pulled the oh. last seven days of leads and it went through, the page would open up and it would send a message. Then it would refresh itself and send another message. Actually, it would send 100 messages to 100 different people. Um, uh, you know, boom, refresh, boom, refresh, boom, refresh. And and I sent it to him and it was it was about it was about 4 a.m. my time, East Coast. He was West Coast. And I sent him the link in the email. I said, hey, when you're ready, open this up and you'll be live again. And, and I send it and I go to sleep because I'd been coding for you know, 12, 13, 14 hours. And and he calls me right away. He's like, hey, man, I opened up that link and it's not working. I got uh, it just says refreshing, refreshing. I said, you opened up the link? And he said, yeah. I was like, close it. Close it now. <laughs> <'Cause it's, laughs> Why? What's wrong? I'm going to just close it. He closes it. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, dude, you just texted like, 3000 people, you know, at like 3 a.m. or 2 a.m., depending on where they were in the country. And sure enough, he opened up his dashboard and his phone lines were just lit up. You know, it's like all these people are calling in to talk about their student loan consolidation. But uh, anyway, the next hey, it's day, probably a good experiment. Like students are up at three in the morning anyway. So. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so anyway, you know, he ran it the next day. And what he found was instead of his normal 10 percent lead to call conversion, he was seeing a 15 percent lead to call conversion, which is significant. I mean, same same marketing spend, same leads inbound. It was a 50 percent increase in performance. Huge. Yeah. And, and he asked me what was different. And, and this goes back to what we talked about a little bit ago or, or earlier on was the the message, the creative was different. You know, like I had woven in different marketing uh, psychology into it. So I was using, you know, hey, Jeremy, instead of just hello. Uh, and I, I would put in recency, you know, thanks for uh, I'm glad you found us on Facebook or Google or wherever they came from. Uh, so now I got social proof and authority uh, in the message. And I would say, look, I, I, I can handle three more calls tomorrow. Uh, try to call me back at this time or this time. So now I had scarcity built into it and it felt humanized. You know, it really seemed yeah. like a real person reaching out. And that got a 50 percent lift in uh, in performance. And that that was the first step. And, and you know. We, quick, we quickly realized that a lot of people were texting back, but we weren't doing anything with those messages. Tony actually figured it out. We, he found some error log that was filling up. This thing was like about to crash our uh, our server. He said, hey, your error log is you know 40 gigs big. And I'm like, what is, I don't even know what that is. And he said, well, every time somebody texts back, Twilio, our, our API handler, was uh, sending a request to our system to say, what do you want to do with this text? But because we didn't have that handler set up, it would just log it to a, a 404 file and, and it was getting bigger and bigger. And we started looking at what people were saying and wouldn't you know it, there was a lot of value there, right? It was like, well, how much does it cost? Can you call me now? I'm with my family. I can't talk. I'm driving. I'm still at school. You know, do I still qualify? A million different iterations. Oh man, a million, literally. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we, you know, we built out a chat room. We, we staffed a handful of people to handle that because back then there was no natural language processing. AI was more of a theory uh, than anything um, or, or only companies that were really working on it were like I, IBM and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And then over the years, you know, we just had iteration after iteration after iteration. Tony, again, very quickly on came in and, and rebuilt everything. We, we staffed out a development team and what we did was we we had our humans, you know, responding to these things contextually uh, that got us eventually up to a 42 percent uh, wow. transfer rate. Again, this is the same data that he was starting at a 10 percent transfer rate. And that's when Tom came to us and said, guys, we really got something here. And credit to him, because uh, Tony and I didn't really think of business that way. We, we would get a project running, get some money going, and then we'd set up the next project and get some other money going. Uh, but Tom really had a, a vision for you know people that he knew that could use the software uh, industry. He saw program. the use case right away once once that happened. Yeah, he was a he was a you know he was a, a real businessman, and and we were you know uh, kind of you know uh, solopreneurs that were you know just just making money on the internet. 
so we, you know, we built the company, we gave it a name, uh, we showed it at a trade show for the first time in 2016, January, I believe. And uh, the rest is history. We, we picked up creditrepair.com at that trade show. We picked up three day blinds, uh, debt.com and a couple others. And uh, now we're servicing companies like Liberty Mutual, you know, uh, monster, monster, monster companies that are that are coming on and using our platform. Talk about the humanized version then yeah, the, and then now. How does that yeah, work? Yeah, the humanized, the, the point of that is like everybody's seen chat bots, right? Everybody's seen web, web chats that say, hello, how can I help you, right? To me, that is a, that is a poor user experience. And you, you say, well, oh, I want to check on my billing account. And it goes, I think you mean billing. Reply billing if you need billing. And you're like, oh, <laughs> God, you know. So the, the point of drips and what we call humanized conversations is we want it to look like a human. We want it to be able to pass the litmus test of you can't tell it's not a human. Even to the point where if you broke it, meaning like our model wasn't able to be sure that we knew what you meant. Like say you said like, oh, I'm on, I'm on with AC on the Rise 25 show. No, no, no AI in the world is going to have a clue what that is, right? So that in our sense would get piped to a human, a quality assurance person mm. that, that would read that. They'd read the whole conversation, the whole thread. Maybe they'd even Google Rise 25, figure out what it is. Oh, and then cool. they would reply contextually. They'd say, oh, sorry, we caught you while you're busy recording. Um, we're happy to reach out, you know, mm. afterwards. When when do you think you'll be done? Right. That's so, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of that, like air log building up, it sends it out of you probably have so many different, you know, you know, versions of this. But if something spits out it, it not computing, it spits it to a human to actually respond. Yeah, and, and all the responses are humanized, meaning that we worked with the brands. They either wrote or approved, you know, what do we say if uh, somebody's uh, driving, right? Mm. Like, like uh, you know, say we're talking about telco carriers, just for a good example, like Verizon may want to have a more professional response and T-Mobile may have a more fun response. Well, don't text and drive, you know, or whatever. Um, so every every brand is right. a voice and right. we're, we're really experts at capturing that brand voice and enabling the brand to have conversations at scale. And then keep in mind, this could be like we're doing things for insurance carriers now where we're texting people saying things like, hey, Jeremy, uh, keep an eye out. Uh, you might want to pull in your car. It looks like a hailstorm is about to hit your area. So now we're helping mm. get claims. That's better cool. User, yeah, better wow. user experience. And again, all the while, it feels to me as the consumer, like I have a real intimate relationship with the brand. Yeah, I want to hear about messaging that works. I think every direct response marketer, copywriter who listens to you talk, it warms their heart because the way you talk about recency, social proof, authority, and scarcity, where did you learn or study or talk to as far as the copywriting goes? Because it's a different skill set. Yeah, absolutely. I, I always say, and I, I think I may have stole this line from Gary V, but the creative is the variable uh, a lot of times. Now, if you got the mechanics and you got the system and you got the natural language processing, like the last piece of it is the creative. And if you have bad creative, it's going to it's going to perform poorly. If you have great creative, it's going to perform as, as great as it can. Um, the, the first time I well, I, first time I learned about it was in college, actually, one of the only classes I actually attended and got decent grades in was a, a psychology class. Mm. And I, I mean, it was just like, it just opened my eyes to so many things. A lot of this like Jedi mind trick stuff, right? The scarcity stuff, the liking, the concessions, like all these different like rules that, that there's just been huge studies done on. There's like, it is, it is, it is in our DNA, right? Like if I see, if you and I are sitting in a room and we see one cookie left on the table, we're going to feel hungry because there's only one cookie left. Right. You know, if there's a pile of cookies, maybe we don't go after him, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's a social one... scientist like the Robert Cialdini's and the Dan Ariely's uh, predictively irrational and influence both of those. Yeah. Influence. Like, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, that, that's the book I always, I always recommend to anybody that's like looking to break into this is, is influence specifically. Uh, that book is amazing. Uh, and, and all of it's applicable. If you're, doing any sort of marketing or sales or, or even just, I mean, really anything. If you're, if you're trying to, you know, date somebody, yeah. you know, the, the way you present uh, yourself on a, on a dating website, you could use a lot of this, a lot of this, uh, yeah. a lot of this stuff. Um, 
so yeah, I think I think the creative is absolutely the variable. Um, Are there we, some messages that stick out that you're like, we kind of cracked this a little bit of this message yeah. really well? Yeah, um, you know, like anytime, really anytime you can be more and more humanized, it, it's it's important. Anytime you can respond contextually, it's it's super important. One thing that I mean, we we find new best practices all the time uh, through our split testing. That's part of what we do is active champion challenge or split testing. Um, one that I, I recall that was fairly recently was we used to on the after hours, somebody came in to call it Liberty Mutual's funnel and uh, we would send one transactional after hours message. Right. Hey, Jeremy, sorry you caused after hours. Uh, looking forward to giving you a quote. This is, this is Bob, Liberty Mutual. Uh, we're open back up Monday, eight to nine o'clock, something like that. Right. Uh, but what we did instead, what one of our account managers figured out was he would put in random times between eight and nine. So we would say, hey, Jeremy, it's Liberty Mutual. Looking forward to reviewing your quote with you. Um, I can call you back Monday, uh, 10, 11, 1 or 3.30. What works best for you? And that got like 80 percent more responses inbound. And and the, the theory is people like multiple choice. They don't like filling mm, in the blanks. Right. And the fact that it looked like there's four spots left. Now you got the scarcity. Right. You got some some guilt associated there because it feels like there's somebody on the other end of the other other end of the conversation that is offering these times. So there's been a there's been a give. Uh so and, and that that's that's been a huge mm. uh, best practice for for after hours. Um, but there's, there's many, 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 many things yeah. like that, you know, texting somebody before you're about to do the call, uh, priming, right? Like setting. Totally. Well, that's what I was saying with that, the water cooler company, I actually was asking, I wanted that right. As a consumer, that well, was actually a good customer experience for me. Something that's been interesting to me and I, and, uh, back when, back when we used to travel <laughs> in, in, in early 2020, uh, I, I used to talk a lot about this on stage, uh, at different shows, but. I think it's interesting is we're, we're similar age, right? Like you remember the time when the phone would ring and it was like a really exciting moment, right? Like, I don't know if you have siblings or not, oh, the, but on the landline. Yeah, the landline. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like me and my sister would almost hurt each other to get to the kitchen to answer the phone when the phone rang or even, even more macro when somebody was at the front door, right? Somebody knocks on the door. Now somebody knocks on the door and you're like hitting the lights. You're like, <laughs> Like, well, you have a ring doorbell and you're looking at who it is. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah and exactly. and, and I, I thought a lot about it and I've unpacked it a ton. Uh, but I think the reason that we were so excited to get a phone call or to get company to came over back in the day was we were just bored to death. Like, it's just that simple. Like nowadays we got, you know, we got podcasts and we got phones and I got 12 missed notifications or text messages, you know, while we've been on this on this thing. And and. I have all these other things to fill my time with. Back back when I was 13, 12, 13 years old, I had a, a TV that had the, the the thing of bonk, 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 you know, and the bunny ears. You couldn't pause sports. You could there was nothing getting delivered the same day or the next day, except for like pizza. You know, that was the only thing you could get on demand. If you needed a ride to somewhere you had to wait for a friend to pick you up. Remember that? Uh, now, now I can get a ride anywhere with a click of a button. So you have this complete shift to like, I can do anything I want whenever I want on demand. Uh, so if you, uh, a marketer or, or an enterprise want to call me like you, good luck, right? Cause I got other stuff I want to be doing. I'm, I'm browsing Netflix. I'm, I'm catching up on the game. I'm, I'm working, I'm reading a book on my phone. Uh, I have other things to fill my time with. And I think that enterprises are, are finally realizing that the, the the day of stealing people's time is is gone. You know, yeah. like, can't get people on email. They're not combing through their direct mail. They're not looking at billboards. You know, it, look around when you're driving. They're not even looking at the road, right? They're doing this. You know, scary. It's super scary. Uh, but that's why you have to be. You have to enable your your companies and your enterprises to have uh, what we call asynchronous conversations, which is like yes. I'll, 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 I'll let you know. I'm going to call. If you don't answer, I'm going to text you again and say, Hey, Jeremy, thought we were on for 12. Let me know what a better time is asynchronous. You know, it's on your time as yep. a consumer. What I want to talk about who's a good fit, who should be using drips and then maybe how the onboarding works a little bit. Yeah. Uh, big brands, you know, enterprises that are, that, that have volume issues. Uh, we're not set up and, and not focusing on the SMB or, or small mm -hmm. DIY uh, 
companies. It's just that's just not how we're set up. We're a managed mm -hmm. technology. So who should be using UAC right now if they're listening and they're not using you? Like you should be using us Ooh. in a in a modest way. You know, like we've got success for other companies. Who should be using you right now? That's not. I'm trying to think of who to say without upsetting any of their <laughs> competitors that are already using us. Uh, really, anybody in the insurance industry, home services industries, uh, uh, financial services. Uh, th those are really our key markets. We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're starting to lean into education and uh, travel. Um, like we're having great conversations with, with a lot of companies that are that they have to look at how to do things differently now. Yeah. Uh, think of like education and how affected travel was or or some of our best clients like like three day blinds. Like we've had to work with them through this whole thing. They, they just you know, they were just bought by Hunter Douglas, one of the largest mm -hmm. uh, window treat or the largest window treatment uh, in, in the in, on earth and uh you know two months later COVID hits and they and they can't operate literally so yeah it's, it's anybody in those sectors mm -hmm. anybody that has a recurring billing model um meaning that they have something that they're trying to service for the company over and over that's why we work with the credit repair.coms of the world and the credit.coms mm -hmm. and the debt.coms and the liberty mutuals and companies like uh you know, home security companies, medical alert companies, legal companies. What's the onboarding look like? Because it seems very culture, you know, dependent on what, you know, you, it seems like you really dig into kind of how they want the messaging um, and how the responses are. Yeah, the, the onboarding is 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 very, very nuanced. Um, we have a very senior group of uh, account executives, very, very senior salespeople, sales engineers, that really go deep and try to be very thoughtful and prescriptive in what we're doing for these companies, because we're not just helping them get a hold of people to, to enable the call center. We're helping drive, uh, you know, adoption. We're helping reduce churn. We're helping, you know, people that got a quote for something that didn't buy right then, helping get them back in the funnel later on. Uh, increasing lifetime value, driving to signatures on e-signs. I mean, there's there's so many places in the funnel where drips can plug in and hold these conversations at these very, very thoughtful moments in time that are critical for the enterprise. And us being an expert in the enterprise uh, businesses themselves is 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 of the utmost importance. Um, th this is a it's a relatively new channel, you know, and many companies don't know how to leverage it appropriately. Uh, most companies don't, almost all companies don't truly. Um, Early so, on, did you decide we're going enterprise or did you experiment with some other um, niches or size companies? Early on, we did what any startup should do is if you had a, a heartbeat, you know, we would sign you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, it didn't matter what you were selling. Uh, you know, it could have been watches or, or, or markers or timeshares. Cause I see a lot of use cases for this. That's why I ask, you know? Yeah, no, early we went, we went super, super wide, right? We just, we focused on more, you know, we signed anybody and anything and we learned a ton, you know? And I think that's when you're trying to find product market fit, I think, I think you have to do that. You know, you, you, you don't, you, you don't know any better, right? Like you have to, you have to like throw it out there, see what works, see what sticks, see what makes sense, figure out how to price it, figure out the, the, problems and the proclivities of different verticals and enterprises. And, and we've honed it, you know, way down now where we disqualify a lot of the inbound business that we get, uh, not because they, they, they couldn't leverage the tool. It's just, there's probably better tools or better companies out there for them. If they're small and you're dealing with 12 or 50 leads a day, that's something you can manage on your own. You can enable two-way texting uh, for your agents to to hold human conversations. But you know, if you're a large mortgage company or a large education company or a large insurance company, and you're doing thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of leads a day, or or you know, you have millions or or hundreds of thousands of members a day that you're trying to remind them to pay a bill or whatever it may be. That's a very very difficult thing to manage at scale. It's it's cost prohibitive. Uh, you run into issues uh, with with blocking, you know, at scale, just like just like you do with email. You know, it's like yeah. you send a couple emails to Gmail, no big deal. You get inbox. Or you try to send a million a day, you better have really, really fine tuned, very you know, high end whitelisted ESPs and and subscri subscribers and, and other things of the like. The and the telco companies are the same. Instead of uh, Gmail, Hotmail, 
Yahoo AOL. It's now T-Mobile, Sprint, Verizon, uh, et cetera. Drips.com. Not an easy domain to get to. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty serendipitous. I, I, you know, we were coming up with things to call drips at the time. And uh, we, I, I found uh, drips was on Sado or Cedo, however you say it, S-E-D-O dot com, the big one of the big domain parking sites. Uh, and it was listed for like eighty thousand dollars or something, it was, you know, way, 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 way out of our budget. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I looked in the who is registry and figured out who owned it and what they had up before. And it was some investment site. I didn't really understand it. But anyway, I reached out to the guy, found his hotmail address and I said, Hey, look, it's me and my buddy. And I'm emailing him from a Gmail and, you know, just a young startup and a couple, couple fellows trying to build this, this cool technology, uh, for, you know, drip, drip campaign enablement across uh, two way texting, which had never been done before. That was always a, uh, uh, an email thing. And we wanted to shorten it and call it drips to give it a, give it our own name and our own nomenclature and get some notoriety around that as a brand. And, uh, he loved it. He was like, that's great. I'm an entrepreneur, you know, blah, blah, blah. Are you guys in, inv-? he asked if we were in investment, uh, software. And I said, no, why? And he said, well, drips is dr- dividend reinvestment some acronym uh, yeah something systems right yeah some acronym I'm like no <laughs> so we had no idea what each other did which meant neither of us value like i didn't value his dot, dot com the way that i could have or should have and nor did he value what we were doing so he ended up selling it to us i'm, I'm proud to say for i think i think it was three thousand dollars wow nice work yeah thank you and you uh, say you're bad at negotiation you're good <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was probably like the only the only one that went well uh, or I got a good deal, but um, yeah, That's amazing. I mean, that, that, that was huge. Like I, I try to tell entrepreneurs now, and I coach a handful of them um, that brand is so important. You know, like when you have a, a, a dot com, and like we spent you know good money and got a good logo, and that's got, street cred. I mean, yeah, that even, five letter even, domain. You got it. Even on day one, we had street cred. Even with no clients, we had we had what looked like authority. You know. E- with, 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 with very little, we had a lot out of the gate. So when three day blinds looked at it, it wasn't, you know, drip dash systems.net. It was, <laughs> it was drips.com, you know, and, yeah. and that, that, that brings a, a level of authority with it that I think, you know, I think a lot of people underestimate these days Yeah, um, with the, the dot nets and the dot biz and the dot IOs and things like that. Two last questions, AC. First of all, appreciate your, you sharing your journey and experience. Super valuable. Everyone should check out drips.com and check out everything they're doing. And if you know someone that he mentioned uh, that should be using it, tell them, check out drips.com because it's a, uh, it's a scalable solution for ag- and humanized also, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, and I, you know, I always ask this inspired insider, what's been, a challenge moment, low moment in the journey, uh, the business and, uh, on the flip side, what's been a proud moment, uh, also what's been uh, a kind of a challenge moment as you talked about. I mean, it's, it's always a windy road. What's been yeah, a uh, challenge moment, low moment for the I think, company. I think in the beginning, you know, f- for me personally, the, the struggle was, uh, trying to build without running out of money, you know, like we, uh, we're, we're, we're Midwesterners, you know, like we, we, my first thought while we we're building this company was not, Oh, we should raise some money and, you know, uh, deploy it and hire a team and you know go against a burn. We, Tony and I had other businesses that were making money and we wanted to build something lasting and something yeah. scalable. You bootstrapped it. Yeah, we bootstrapped it. So we, we put in, you know, a, you know, a lot of money of our own. Uh, but that, 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 that was, it was a finite amount, you know, we didn't have millions of dollars to deploy. So we, we deployed the little we had and, and then it was a race against, you know, making money. Like I remember back in the day we were, we were making in a month what we are by noon now, you know, uh, on a, on a Tuesday. And, and I remember thinking like, Oh, if we just get to this next level, this next level. And we, Tony and I pushed ourselves to the brink. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I got to the point where I had to get medicated. I had uh, audible hallucinations, which is a, a terribly trippy thing if you've never experienced it. But we would work so hard and run into the red so long for so many days in a row that I would try to go to sleep. And I, w- I could literally hear my partner, Tony's voice in my head saying random words. And this mm. was a, this was a cause of, of just stressing out too much and never, never, you know, getting real rest and, 
and just being in the red for too long. And and once that happened, I realized I had to you know prioritize my sleep a little bit better and prioritize. I my just got the aura ring the other few days ago. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, and and since then, you know, now I'm like I'm a big proponent of meditation and saunas and cold showers and steam rooms and all this other crap to prioritize your health. Yeah, I, big time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, in the beginning, like I had to kill myself uh, bef- because there was we were running out. You know, what I mean, like there was a finite moment. It wasn't next week. It wasn't next month, but it was coming. And 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 the more I worked, the further I could push that that date out. Uh, so th- that that's hard, you know, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize that I, I sometimes, you know, I follow a handful of people or friends of mine that are starting their own stuff online. And I see all the time they're talking about you know, the game or the last series of, uh, whatever game of Thrones or whatever. And I know, I know these people are building, I know they're running out of money and I'm watching and I'm just like, what are you doing? Like, how do you have the time to follow sports? Like, uh, it, you know, I mean, it's not for everybody, right? Like, like punishing yourself and, and pushing yourself as hard as we did absolutely isn't for everybody, but I know very few companies that bootstrapped, uh, to the level that we've gotten to that didn't have that type of upbringing, um, where they just, they just ran as hard as they possibly could. So, you know, I've had plenty of personal struggles with that. My, my, my wife, you know, having to ride that roller coaster with me has had personal struggles. Um, so that's probably one of my, my most down moments was just the, you know, just getting through that candidly. And then, but, but on the, on the other side of it, now we have a, a very strong senior leadership team, uh, I'm very emboldened and empowered by them. Uh, and I got people now that are doing stuff much better than I ever could. And they, t- you know, every, every new one of those uh, men and women on the leadership uh, page and, and the other managers and other employees, like they take a huge lift off of our shoulders. And, and now I can focus on the things I want to focus on. I don't have to just, you know, kill myself to get that next deal or to, you know, get that next case study or, or write that next level of code or whatever it is. I'm everybody is pushing in the same direction and, and I'm, you know, still right there with them, but I'm able to, to do what I'm uniquely capable of doing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Totally appreciate it. Everyone check out drips.com. AC really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye everybody. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.